Greetings, friends. Welcome to our Wednesday meditation and talk. We're being webcasted on my Facebook and YouTube pages and IMCWs as well. We begin with meditation. So please take some moments to find the posture that will most allow you to feel awake and at ease. Letting your attention go inward. You might feel your body breathing and sense the breath coming in and out of your heart. Paying attention to your heart, you might ask yourself, What is my deepest intention for being here right now, for practicing meditation? And listen. What is the longing of the heart? What is it that matters to you in your life? In the stillness, let your senses be awake. One of the most direct portals to presence is very conscious awakening through the body. So you might gently scan through the body perhaps first bringing the attention to the eyes and letting them soften. It can help to feel and imagine a smile spreading through the eyes, lifting the outer corners of the eyes. Let the brow be smooth and sense the sensations, the aliveness in that whole region. softening and feeling what's here. In the same way, you might feel a slight smile at the mouth. Even sense a smile on the inside of your mouth, letting the jaws unhinge, the tongue fill the lower palate. Relaxing down to the root of the tongue. And opening to feel the sensations that fill the tongue, the gums, the lips, the whole mouth. Softening and feeling aliveness. Letting the sensitivity spread through your whole face. Feeling the scalp and the skull. Feeling the whole head from the inside out. Allowing the shoulders to fall away from the neck. Feel the sensations that arise in the neck, throat, and inside the shoulders. Letting awareness fill the shoulders, you might imagine a dissolving from 
ice to water. Ice to water. And can you imagine water to gas? Softening and feeling the aliveness. You might sense the length, the volume, the weight of your arms. Letting your hands rest in an easy, effortless way. Softening the hands. Maybe softening again. Feeling from the inside out as you soften the aliveness that's right here. Let there be an openness to the chest. And you might imagine and feel that curve of a smile spreading through the heart spreading through the chest. Softening and allowing yourself to feel the aliveness, the energy inside the chest. a receptive, interested presence. Softening resistance, opening to aliveness. Scanning down the torso, letting this next breath be received in a softening belly. This breath, now this one, and again, I'm feeling from the inside out, receptive to the sensations and aliveness that fill the belly. And again, softening the eyes, smiling into the eyes. Slight smile at the mouth. Smiling into the heart. Hands are soft. Belly is soft. Scanning down to feel the pelvic region from the inside out. Relaxing and opening to the aliveness, sensations and energy that's there. Aware of the legs, the length, volume, the weight. Feeling from the inside out, the aliveness of sensation. Feeling the feet filled with awareness, filled with sensation. And feel your rootedness of the feet into the earth so you can sense this whole vast earth body and that energy flowing up through the feet, 
through the body, flowing up to fill you with awareness and energy. So you can sense your body as a field of sensation. Relaxing back and letting everything happen. Tingling, vibrating, places of flow or tightness, pleasantness or unpleasantness, space or density. This whole dance of sensation. including sound in this dance of aliveness. So you relaxing back and listening. You're listening not just with your ears, but with your whole awareness. With your whole awareness listening to and feeling the moment, the whole moment. So there's an awareness in the foreground of the changing flow of sound and feelings, sensations. And in the background, that vast open wakefulness. Resting in awareness, relaxing with the changing flow of experience. Letting everything be just as it is. And when you notice that you've left this open wakefulness when the attention's gone into thoughts of the future or the past. When you notice that, you can just gently relax open again, reawaken the senses. You might listen again. You might soften in the body, the shoulders, the hands, slight smile in the mouth, soften and open to the aliveness. Once again, listening to and feeling the whole moment.
You might find that meditation means turning back to presence, opening to presence again and again, choosing presence, letting the here and now be your refuge, reawakening the senses, listening to and feeling just what's here. And if it's difficult, calling on the kindness of awareness, perhaps sending the message, this belongs, feeling it as sensations, noticing how it changes. Choosing to stay moment to moment, listening to and feeling the moment. In these last few moments, calling on the presence of your heart and offering whatever blessing or wish you'd like to offer to yourself, whatever prayer of care. And then in that heart space, including other beings in this world, holding the world in your heart and sensing your prayer of care for all beings. As a part of coming back, you might take a few long, deep breaths. And opening your eyes if they're closed, moving a bit. And as you transition into informal mindfulness, I'll share a few of the upcoming announcements. I invite you to my website, tarabrock.com, for my virtual offerings and other resources and materials that are available there. And also to check out imcw.org for the live stream offerings made available by our local DC area teachers. And the affinity groups meeting this week for IMCW are women, seniors, living mindfully with illness, vegans, black, indigenous, and people of color, Asian and Pacific Islanders, and teens. I'd also like to invite you after the talk is over to join in a mindful dialogue group. The call and information is tarabrock.com slash class. And it's a wonderful opportunity to get to know others who are listening to the talks, find out what was touching them, what touched you, bring it more alive in daily life. So I hope you join in. And finally, many are aware that the teachings are offered freely and your donations are um, really making a difference. And I like to encourage that you offer only what you can afford and to feel your heart. And as you offer, know that what you give is uh, truly received with a lot of gratitude. Okay, my friends, now for this week's talk.
Namaste. Welcome, friends. Today I'm having a conversation with Stephen Folder, who's a senior Buddhist teacher, and he's a lifelong peace activist who lives and teaches in Israel. So in this conversation, Stephen shares about his experience these last couple of weeks, the unfolding violence in the Middle East, and what he and his community are doing to tend to the huge trauma people are feeling. Um, he talks about how to be with intense fears and emotions. And he also talks about how to communicate with people who have very different views. So he shares about um, the decades, these past decades of this very deep and powerful work he's been doing, uh, bringing groups of Israeli and Palestinian people together to find their shared hearts and humanity. And uh, together we talk about really what's our refuge, what's our true refuge in the midst of uh, this very traumatizing world, and what are the pathways that can carry us uh, to equanimity, compassion, to love. So I want to note that during our conversation, and this is due to the activity of the Israeli military, there's some static interference on the internet. So you will notice it in several spots. Okay, dear ones, I really hope that this expands your heart, expands your mind. First of all, how are what is the immediate status for you and Rachel? How are you doing? We're okay. We're really all right. Personally, I would say in, we. Rachel is just now starting the olive harvest with the. She she doesn't also use kind of machines and so on. She depends on two or three Bedouin grandmothers, and oh there's my. three grandmothers together d doing the olive harvest. So she's doing the olive harvest. I'm. Uh, doing a lot of connection with people in Israel and, and abroad, and uh, but also simplicity, vegetable garden, feeding animals, living simply as well. It's important to, for that ground uh, that I feel that sort of base of the small things in life. So we're fine physically, and I don't feel a big risk unless things really go blow up with Lebanon and Hezbollah. And then we're in serious trouble. I uh, don't quite know what we're going to do. But uh, the moment, but I have to say that I'm feeling quite a lot of pain from just the sense, the whole day there is artil artillery going from the Israeli side to the Lebanese side. So you hear the booms all the time and it just feels like so much pain there. Uh, where is it falling? Where on who is the the shells falling? And 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 the soldiers themselves and the whole thing is very painful. Uh, so I'm feeling that pain in the body and in the in the mind and in the heart. Um, mm. But I don't feel risk. Mm. So I want to pause here because I want to just say to anyone that's listening, uh, we jumped right in. Maybe you could start just to so anyone listening knows where you're located and where you're located in relationship to all that's going on and what your personal experience has been over the last couple of weeks kind of get us tuned in here yeah thank you tara um well i'm living in galilee uh, in a ecological gandhi mahatma gandhi inspired village um, which I helped to start, now has a thousand souls in it, lots of children. Um, it's not right up against the Lebanese border, but it's relatively close. So our experience has been uh, in the last two weeks personally of being watchful. And at the same time, as I say, listening to the military activity, which is there around us constantly. Um, so it's in the north. The south of Israel is where the uh, Hamas uh, invaded and caused so much death, destruction and tragedy and pain. Uh, we're in the north and so far we're not at great risk. Uh, but 
uncertainty for sure. Um, I'm imagining, though, that you know many people who either have lost their lives or know people who have, that it's not very far from you. It's very close. And constantly I'm meeting people. And I'm, I have to say that uh, there is first aid here needed. And first aid is spiritual first aid, emotional first aid, and physical first aid. And that is immediate, and some people are shattered. And in the, the Dharma community has been very, very active uh, in, in Israel and giving that first aid help to people who are really coming from that slaughter and uh, need relief, need help, need a kind soul, need love, need food sometimes. Um, so I'm feeling that very much and I'm meeting people all the time, but at the same time, of course, meeting a huge rage and anger and revenge and desire for violence and so on. And that's also painful. Personally, when it broke out, I had two days, um, Saturday morning when, it, when, when I heard about it early, two days when my heart was just so heavy, I couldn't talk to anybody. I couldn't teach. Mm. I couldn't. <laughs> I was just in that heaviness. Mm. And I needed to be quiet. And I just settled. I sat with the compassion of the heart saying, this is beyond anything for the people around. This is beyond. And I just let my heart flow. On the second, on the third day, I could begin to connect with people and teach. I have to say that um, sometimes I've really felt fear in the body coming from a place that I don't understand exactly what well, the mind doesn't sort of give me a cause cause of it, but I feel I'm picking up a lot of the fear mm -hmm. it's entering the body. Sometimes it happened the other morning. I woke up at four o'clock and I just, the body was filled with fear. I don't know why there's no reason. Uh, so I just worked with it and, and explored it and opened it and met it and hugged myself <laughs> Uh, and then after 10, 50 minutes, I said, I renounced it. I said, OK, thank you, fear. I've seen you. Enough is enough. Mm -hmm. I'm going mm -hmm. for a cup of English tea. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, I just want to slow down here, Stephen, because you just described, I mean, so many are feeling fear. Those in Israel, those in Gaza, those here in the United States, I mean, just fear, grief, so many strong emotions. And you just described very powerfully, okay, so you just stayed with it and you felt it and you hugged yourself. And uh, yeah, and maybe just to say a little more for so many of us that, um, you know, I was just with a group yesterday and the, the level of the anguish that so many are feeling it's very very strong so maybe just because you've been teaching buddhist teachings mindfulness for so long how do we work with the trauma and the strong emotions that are coming up right now yeah um when emotions are so strong i was able to deal with the fear you know in a relatively uh kind of friendly way but um when the fear is so strong so overwhelming um you need more basic tools and um you need support of a sense that kindness isn't lost in the world so helping community uh, kind eyes you need someone to listen Mm. deep listening and being able to hold the tears and the stress and the confusion um it's another first aid uh and from the dharma point of view you can kind of offer moments of relief to people who have overwhelmed overwhelmed by fear like um you know like i said the cup of tea is the symbol but just exist life is still there so I don't think it may not be appropriate to teach meditation in those situations uh, in, a in a classic way. They may not be able to have access to mindful awareness, but a sense of um, the lived process is still going on. 
and we can take a walk together outside and we can sit under a tree for a moment and just feel that this life is still going on and we can see that a kid passing by or an, a dog in, and looking you know and and the birds above and somehow reconnect with the life process is also a fundamental healing that even in most extreme situations can can help uh, and final thing is just compassion mm. because you know compassion just flows um, a small story that I want to share with you the other day um, I was uh, in the local town and I met a woman who said just what is a lot of people are saying uh, we have to wipe them out I can't believe what's happening we, we, this is horrible and horrendous and indeed it is but the response there's no way I could argue with that woman and say there's another way she wouldn't be ready to listen to it but the compassion in my heart said I hear you I understand where you're coming from I have to say there are other ways of looking at things. I hope you'll respect the fact that I, there are other ways of looking. But right now, I really hold your pain and I understand you. And I, I, I'm listening. And, and that's about all I could do in that situation. Um, so it's, it's hard. Uh, when it's extreme, it's hard. Well, I heard there's just so many things I want to kind of unpack or pause with. Because one of the things that when it's when there's trauma trauma means we're cut off and you just described beautifully how if we come back into relationship if we can be there with each other you know if you are struggling if if you can see my eyes and know they care that that begins the process of coming back and we need that i saw that yesterday with you know, one woman, this was on a Zoom, um, who was just feeling um, just so much heartbreak. And she said, I can't even, I can't even meditate. I can't even sit. And, and I asked the group, how many of you are feeling that? And most hands went up. And for her to see hundreds of people feeling like they were distraught, she knew she wasn't alone. So that feeling of whatever we're feeling when there is such yes. a huge, huge um, disruption and horror, it's natural and that we're not alone. And I love the way you said that. And then describing just belonging again to life right here in the moment, that I can see my dog and pet my dog or see a tree and lean against it. Or, you know, we need to reconnect. So thank you for that. Yeah. And it, they're moments of relief, shall we say. And, and then an understanding that things change, the intensity of the fear and anger and hate often um, will always change. So the language of people now after two weeks is already changing. And uh, I notice it, there's, there's a movement. So um, everything passes and changes uh, you can't say that to someone in the middle of the heat, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. but but there is a sense that okay, there are there's movement, there is other ways of being, and things change. Well, there's something about trusting in that, and then bringing that trust to just that encounter you described, Stephen, with the with the woman, because. You know, it's such a challenge for most of us when people really don't agree with us. <laughs> you know, when we have strong opinions and they clash, it's such a challenge. And to not try in the heat of things to change another person's mind, but just to meet their heart, that allows yeah. the change you describe to happen. Gradually, we wake up. Gradually. Yeah. And there is a, a beautiful text um traditional sutta buddhist text that i like where someone asks the buddha what do you do when you meet someone with really strong views really strong emotions that uh, can't you can't argue with them and the buddha said never underestimate the power of equanimity in situations like that 
you can't argue with someone who has strong views and strong emotions at that moment, but you can, but the power of equanimity, and I would add, add their trust because your word, and I think it relates to your radical acceptance, um, trust, which is not hope that things are going to be better. Trust is something deep in us that says, I can meet what arises. I am ready to meet this situation. It's a kind of resource of, of um, power in a way. And I've, it's the first chap, first part of the, my book on the five powers, the, the first power of trust. Our ability to stand steady and meet even the most difficult circumstances. And I think that can be built. And certainly the Dharma and meditation practice helps us to do that. It's one of the powers inside mindfulness that we may not notice, but our ability to meet pain, even in the body, allows us to say, yes, I'm ready to meet pain in the community, in the world, in conflict. Mm, so you're describing almost the inner quality, um, the, the Tibetans call it the lion's roar, that confidence, that awareness can meet any situation and it can actually become sort of the, the fuel for awakening our hearts and minds. And so if we know that, then I encounter a person who is very caught in a very angry, uh, blaming place. And there's some trust in me that this is, I don't have to change a mind. We can't change minds like that. And um, I love the way you described meeting the heart. And also the other thing that comes to mind for me is being honest with our own certainties about things. <laughs> because, you know, every day, and this is just my personal confession, every day as I'm taking in the news or whatever, I keep running into my own very solid views of good, bad, right, wrong, you know, and they're, they're very, very strong in my body. And I have to keep mm -hmm. being present till I get back to the place that deep down, I don't know, you know, I may know that, that love is the way, but I don't know the particulars of the steps. I, I don't know how this all can this trauma, this play out of generations and centuries of trauma, how it can unwind itself. Uh, we're just living into it with as much awareness as possible. And if I meet you or another from that don't know mine, there's a lot more space for genuine listening, because I can't listen when I know, and 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 an honest connecting. So I feel like all of us have to get more humble together on that front. <laughs> I think our, our mutual fragility and vulnerability is actually a strength because it's connecting us to the truth of things. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it gives us strength. And indeed, if someone says, how can you talk about another way of doing things? I mean, one of the things that I talk about is the fact that um, this is the fourth or fifth time that there's been a war with Gaza. And it shows it hasn't worked. There's not, it, it shows that this, this, the, the, the failure to find another way, if the cycle repeats itself every few years, it shows that something wasn't done. And uh, I very much feel when people say, challenge me about this, I said, we're talking about paths that were not taken, mm -hmm. roads that were not taken, there's so many opportunities for changing in a hundred years, nearly changing the situation that was not taken and the reactivity keeps winning. Mm -hmm. And, um, but if they ask me exactly, what do you think you should do? I say, I'm not prime minister, <laughs> uh, but I mean, there are things that there is another way. There's always mm -hmm. another way and many ways. And it depends on our wisdom and our heart. And uh, sometimes in the, kind of political re arena wisdom and heart is in short supply <laughs> yes yes Stephen this is let's get down a little bit more weedy here and you have been for decades now you have been working actively for peace 
and and fostering dialogue and connection. And I just would love you to share with me and with all of us just a little bit of what has gone on in the past. We know right now channels are pretty closed down, but there was a lot, there's been a lot going on. So let us know a little about that. Yeah, indeed. There are a very large number of um, peace-oriented groups um, that are doing, I would say, heroic work in times <clears throat> of great stress and difficulty and often violence. And um, I can talk about my the organization I started uh, called Middle Way. Um, and uh, we were going to the Palestinian areas when the army says you can't go, nobody was going, it was forbidden area. And we felt the fear going there, but bringing groups of Israelis to meet groups of Palestinians, w w feeling really this was a sacred act, like uh, Shanti Deva said, to go into the shoes of the other, to listen to the other. This We felt this was a sacred act, and we kept doing it year after year after year. And indeed, we met sometimes Palestinians who were very full of rage and anger and wanted said to other Palestinians, how is it you can invite Israelis? But always the result was a radical shift. And it was amazing to see in two days of, I would say, uh, using a, a tools of the Dharma, but not calling it Dharma, not calling it Buddhist tools at all, um, creating in two days a total shift of people ending up being feeling like brothers and sisters, uh, Palestinians and Israelis, even Israeli soldiers and Palestinian kind of street fighters, and kind of in two days shifting totally. So it gave us a very strong sense that peace is possible. It's not so difficult. And uh, it just needs the will and the readiness. And we were doing uh, also peace walks all over Israel for years and years with Israelis and Palestinians and Jews and Arabs, um, just showing, look, here's Jews and Arabs together, quietly, steadily, friendly, <laughs> sending out kindness to everybody in the street, even if they shout at us, and giving a model of how things can be different. So all of these were hap are happening and are still happening, but they're very small voices and they didn't make a major difference. The Palestinian Authority uh, in the end said, you, you didn't make a change. You didn't make peace to our group, to Middle Way. And we said, that's not what we're doing. We're doing a more of an education so that a teacher knows to use a different language to his his students, a Palestinian teacher, Israeli teacher. We're doing a kind of peace education. We're not trying to be do politics. Um, we're giving a language. We're giving people that we're listening. There's something different. Uh, but it's hard going. And uh, as I say, I use the image that we need to keep a, can a small candle burning. It's like a pilot light that when karma <laughs> and the situation allows, at least there's a small light which will hopefully uh, light a bigger flame. So we just keep that image in mind of keeping, not losing totally the, the sense is possible. It's like you said. Um, do you have Palestinian friends that have been working with you over the years on this or that you're in touch with right now? Uh, yes, we do have Palestinian friends. Uh, I'm in touch here and there with Palestinians. In the last two weeks, I haven't, I've only been in touch with one or two Palestinian friends. Um, but we do have, we do keep contact, yes. And, what, is that, uh, what has that been like in these true. last two weeks? Just, I mean, because there's so much that's gone on and I could imagine it would be so much harder to be in touch. And how was it to have communication in these two weeks? Well, it's what I was saying at the beginning. It's just holding their pain. Yeah. It's just about 
okay, I am with you. And they still ask because the whole, you know, should we say a lot of the population, some of the people who are kind of rather peace oriented have been pushed by the extreme of violence that happened in the South have been pushed into a uh, reactive, angry, and revengeful place. So they check with me, are you still with us <laughs> even mm. now? And they mm. check with others, are you still with us? You still, you're still, your heart is still for peace even now, because they're not sure. So um, basically we hold their pain and we give the message, we're still with you. Um, there's something here which is being a human being, which is deeper than the uh, violence. And that's, let me say that our village in the north, and maybe people don't know that, your, your listeners don't know that, but in the north of Israel, in the Galilee, Jews and Arabs have been living together happily uh, for uh, the last 50 years. And um, in daily life contact all the time, we have Arab kids playing in our, in our, in our, with the Jewish kids in the playground, they're coming to the kindergarten. Uh, all the time there's interactions, there's peace between Arabs and Jews in the Northern Israel. And there has been for a long time. I wouldn't say e <clears throat> equality, but a, a sense that Jews and Arabs both say, we cannot live anymore under conflict and the kind of hidden agreement that says we need to live together and it, and it works. So here's a model that it, it shows it's possible. I wonder, um, you, you talked about that when you'd get together, you'd hold a space and feel uh, pain, the pain, their pain. Um, and I wonder if it was a mutual process because there's pain all over the place. And it's almost like to be really equals and to have compassion be truly a mature compassion. It's not your pain, it's our pain. And that if you're eyes into eyes with your Palestinian friend, it would they would be feeling yours and you'd be feeling theirs because you know, there are literally centuries of um, trauma that have, are the background to what's going on. So it needs careful, it needs basic friendliness, firstly, to sense that there is really no difference between us. We're human beings together here, trying to solve something which is bigger than us. And so basic friendliness is a place of where we, Israelis and Palestinians, could somehow relax together and um, feel a, a kind of a little bit kindness and, and mm. caring as mm. human beings. Um, but the heart of the workshops that we did was the one-to-one -one Palestinian Israeli for one hour in dialogue and looking at each other's pain mm. and listening to each other's life mm. and each other's struggle. And it's true that the Palestinian had far more daily life struggle mm -hmm. and pain than the yes. Israelis. The Israelis yes. coming, you know, from Tel Aviv, they're sitting in coffee houses and so on. They're in another place altogether. Palestinians, every family has someone in prison. Every family has someone killed. Um, however, that asymmetry was also a sense that there's a suffering there that is not in our hands. The, the, the asymmetry itself is, is suffering and a cause of compassion and a cause of sympathy. Yes, there's asymmetry. We didn't design that, but we're together now. So we kind of... Uh, bringing us two together, including the asymmetry, on the basis of the transformation of suffering. It really was based on the fact that suffering, when it's met fully with heart and mind, not necessarily Dharma people, ordinary people saying, let's work with the suffering rather than drown under it. And I think in this time, if someone asked me, 
you know, what's, is there some light at the end of the tunnel? It is possible that this crisis could create opportunities. And if we have that mind that the crisis is a source of opportunity or change, um, maybe something, um, maybe it gives a bit of hope here. Thank you. And I'm going to come back to hope because I want to talk more about where is the hope. I um, want to um, just pause with something. I feel like it's really important what you said about including the asymmetry. Because it's so easy to say, well, we're all suffering, you know, and not get that there really is a hierarchy of privilege and power and that we're all suffering and that hierarchy is the cause and it, and it makes all of us suffer, but there are much more immediate raw sufferings and that that needs to be honored. So I really appreciate the the honesty of that, that that applies to um, trying to work with bridge the divides with racism and with everything. So um, So thank you for that. I just wanted to hear a little more about, you talked about how the Dharma community is really, really active right now in terms of all the levels of first aid and maybe just give us some examples of what's going on so we who aren't there can feel like how are people extending to each other right now? Yeah, I have to say that the Dharma community in Israel is very alive. It's very dynamic. Uh, it has a relatively young age in terms of the average age um because we have a big dharma retreat center uh which is based entirely on dana and everything is based on dana we, and and somehow that's helped to uh to reduce the age so we have young a lot of young people including soldiers and who who are dharma students mm. and it's been amazingly active so they've gone for example a lot of the people from the um kibbutzim moshavim around Aza that had that were really traumatized have gone to hotels in the Dead Sea area and Dharma people have gone there to sit with them to talk to them to give uh, a little bit of meditation practice as much as is possible um, to give psychological help uh, we've supported psychologists who themselves are struggling to receive that amount of trauma. And the psychologists themselves are exhausted very often, and they are going. So the Dharma people have been able to kind of support the therapist as well as... Then um, there's there's been uh, many, many groups and Zoom meetings with hundreds, maybe thousands mm -hmm. of people. Uh, the, the Dharma, uh, Dharma people have been um, running constantly every day uh with different populations um what happens in those groups if you're let's say in an online zoom group with a, with a number of people who are just living with the immediacy of of the trauma uh what how do you work those what creates the safety how does it bring some healing well i think that they need to be heard <clears throat> there is um a quality of um, anything, should we say, non-judgment, um, your emotional life, your the anger and the fear and the pain you feel is honest, legitimate, held, and, and, and we are with you. Mm. And at the same time, though, giving voice for others to give another way of looking at things because it's not every zoom group is there's only maybe a certain relative small number of people who are directly affected and then there's a large number of people who are indirectly affected and some of them will come with 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 a with a really different view for example someone came in the zoom group uh, i did a couple of days ago a woman came and said she's helping others um in a center uh cooking bringing food uh, to people who have uh, kind of fled from the south of the country. And who was helping her was an older woman who was an Arab. Mm. And uh, the uh, she the um, the older woman said, uh, 
how, how do you look at me now, the Arab woman? And the Jewish, also elderly woman said, Ochti. And Ochti is the Arab word for my sister. Mm. And then she said, if I was from Gaza, would you say the same, Ochti? And she said, absolutely. And altogether, I have to that the Donald community also affected by confusion because um, either life connection, the body, the, the breath, the, the trees, and, and, and the Dharma. And then along comes the violence and the military, and, and they don't fit together. Hmm. There's somehow one in, in, can interfere with the other. And uh, so we are relating to that quite a bit inside groups, which I would say really the kind of dialogue between Buddha nature and human nature. Hmm. So allowing the human nature which is the trauma and the and the and the pain and yes and the anger, human nature and allowing the Buddha nature and um, which is a big word but it really means the place in us which is our more open, uh, in, less personal, less subjective, interconnected place which which is there it hasn't been lost, so it's kind of allowing that dialogue between the Buddha nature and human nature. And a lot of what I'm doing with groups is to remind people about refuge. A refuge in, a, again, non-Buddhist way, but a sense that there is a shelter. People going in and out of shelters when the rockets come, but they go in a shelter and then come out of a shelter after 10 minutes when the sirens stop. But I kind of help Try to help people say there is a shop within us that it, you don't need to leave. It's there all the time. And it's a sense of our big space, our openness, our steadiness, that we're there in facing the mystery of life. And, and we can be held by that. So that sense of awareness and, and big heart and mind, really noticing it as a refuge that we can acknowledge the buddha said that um be an island to yourself and he was saying it in relation to not getting swept away by the consensus and by um other you know difficulties and pain but finding your ground and then when asked how to do that, he basically said, find refuge in your inner truth. What is happening right now? Where is my life right now? How do I experience my life right now? I'm settled in this moment of my inner truth. And uh, it's a very kind of very inspiring answer. So I feel like we're what you're speaking to now, Stephen, is kind of right at the heart of where all the healing lies and that is that we all have some refuge some sense of belonging to something larger that our that our world isn't identified with this um threatened ego self but that there is something larger some mystery awareness there's so many words uh love buddha nature god something larger and that is what saves us and as you say you know, if we're talking about the pathway to refuge, a key pathway is presence, is, okay, right this moment, what's true? Another key pathway, as we well know, is to turn towards love. And if it doesn't feel like it's there, to ask for love, to pray for love, to notice where the field of connectedness is, because in the moment that you and I know that we're holding hands, that we're both loving this life. We both care. In that shared sense, there's refuge. So it's a little misleading to say it's within us as a as an island because it's actually uh, 
an island that's completely connected underground with, you know, with all other islands, you know, because it's really completely. a belonging to the whole. And and I love the word refuge, by the way. I think it's beautiful the way you put it, that you can take it a refuge in the midst of an a siren and go into your shelter. And there's an ongoing shelter in any moment that we say what's true or we turn towards love, we can find it again. And it takes practice and training. It does. I mean, the Buddha um, used the word apamada more than he used and being more important than the word sati which is mindfulness and apamada is caring awareness is mm. an awareness that is caring that mm. is appropriate that brings healing and uh he said it's the biggest tool in the in the buddhist toolbox um i have to say that i think in the western world mindfulness has been a little bit misunderstood mm. or has been kind of co-opted co or hijacked a little bit by western culture which is mind culture and uh, i see first of all i don't really like the word mindfulness too much anymore <laughs> um the my book uh is, is use the word uh, a root in hebrew which is um awakened or or a wakefulness or presence i think inside mindfulness love is inherent mm -hmm. it cannot mindfulness cannot work without it because just giving attention just giving attention is already putting the heart where the attention goes you give your attention to this hand right now i'm giving my attention to this hand the heart is right behind there. It cannot be anywhere else. So, I, 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 of course, I do retreats on metta and the more formal practice, but I'm also very, very clear saying, don't you don't need to do anything formal. Right inside the sense of presence is heart. Heartfulness is right there at the core because you can't see anything without it. You can't, no, the mind doesn't go anywhere without the heart behind it. Uh, <laughs> the, the, to, the meeting place of our awareness with the world is a meeting place that has inherent love in it. Yeah, it's like in Asia, the scripts, heart, mind are not separated and heart presence is one of the most beautiful descriptions of mindfulness. I know, and like you, I, I um, always feel that there's some deep misunderstanding when mindfulness is, is interpreted in that more narrow way. One thing that a lot of people find, though, is that when they pay attention, and, I, and attention is the most fundamental expression of love, I, I think that's a very powerful understanding, it doesn't feel like love right away. Initially, when we pay attention, we might encounter the kind of um, tensions or dissociations or tightness that make it make our hearts still feel contracted. But what I've found is that if we can accept no matter what it is, if we can say yes to what we're paying attention to, just agree to be with it, acceptance is the gateway to that loving. Acceptance opens us up to that loving, which is, as you say, embedded in attention. It's just not always immediately accessible or recognizable. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, love is very basic. We have to love ourselves, otherwise we couldn't live. So if you're paying attention to your breathing, you're naturally close, interested, embracing the breath of life. And it, it, I agree with you, sometimes it needs reminders because of habit energy that has resistance or has distance and so on. But, if, but, but quite easily, if you feel that mindful awareness and, shall we say, meditation practice is connecting, is closeness, is 
deep meeting, allowing, as you say, allowing something to be what it is, allowing this hand to say, I'm here with the hand, with touch, with presence, that sense of listening, I'm here, says the whole body mind. I'm here, says all the voices we're listening to. I'm here, says the trees and the sky above and the earth underneath. And that's enough. That's it. You just have to kind of make that switch. So, you know, resistance can be, I think, quite easily overcome by that kind of readiness to see it's already, we already have it. It's already there. Yeah, beautiful. Always already here. And so maybe as a, a final kind of reflection for us, here we are in a time where as a species, it's a very traumatized time around the planet. Right now, a lot of eyes are focused on the Middle East, but oh my gosh, you know, 500,000 refugees from Darfur, you know, and the, the Rohingya, and it's just all over the planet, we have enormity of trauma. And trauma is cut off. Trauma means rather than sensing the I'm um, here and that connectedness with our body, heart, mind, there's really a cutoff. And, and we're going to have to endure and be very tender towards that cutoffness that is around us. As you said, initially, when you're working with somebody who's traumatized, you don't you know, say, well, sit down and meditate for 45 minutes because it may re-traumatize them. So given that i'd like to ask you given the situation in particular palestines israelis where for you what gives you the most hope what is it that you hold open to with possibility that that keeps you energized and knowing you can take the next step um for me and for others that are perhaps more deeply engaged uh, in, I would say, the inner world or inner practice, um, it's the sense of interrelation and interbeing, or in, in, that there's something in all of us that is connected already. And all of us can feel it as being a kind of just a love for our children, for the land, for the... Mm. So there's something fundamental which is needs to be touched. And it's mm. about, as I say, interbeing. I, I'll just give you a small story. My granddaughter, one of my granddaughters, uh, used to be really upset by the state of the world at the age of 13. Now she's 16. And the other day I met her and she was kind of very happy and we talked about global warming and she and 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 the the climate disaster and she was quite happy i said you you're not the same as you were a few years ago when we talked about it she said no because i know that life knows what to do and the planet knows what to do and humans can screw things up but life is bigger than us and i trust life to 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 know what what what's needed life will carry on I trust life. And it was like, whoa, how big mind there. Um, but it's our, I think, our sense that there is something bigger that's holding all of us. And if we, that gives us support in any way that we can feel it. So even in a local sense, shall we say here in the Galilee, with the Arabs and the, and the Jews together, an Arab kid can say, actually, it's so... I, it's so good that I can tell you my story and you can tell me your story and we can sit together with a cup of coffee and I can see the way your I can come to your weddings and your celebrations and 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 your funerals and you can come to ours and it's kind of the sense of being together is so powerful that it may it has a very strong voice I agree with you the trauma when it's big um it's almost uh, undigestible. It's not something that we can really hold. It it will take its own path. I feel like you, a huge amount of suffering and um, pain in the world. Um, 
but there is this one place that we just have to hold on to as much as we can and experience as much as we can and give it as much as we can to others. And I think you're doing that and I'm doing that and others are doing that saying there is a place of being, connecting bigger circles, connecting with the world, which is bigger than us. And it's not about me. And that sustains us in a way. It's a compassionate heart. It sustains, us, it sustains us with huge energy. People who are really connected with a compassionate heart, they don't get tired. It's like the Bodhisattva doesn't say, oh, well, um, I, I've, I've had enough now. <laughs> I can't be bothered. Tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll help others tomorrow. I'm, it's, it's not, it's not uh, <laughs> possible. <laughs> But the compassionate heart, which is the heart that knows interrelation, is a huge source of energy and a huge source of hope. But the rest, we have to let go. Karma is bigger than us, just like my granddaughter said. Karma is bigger than us. We can't hold that. all of that. The karma has to do what it can do. We can contribute. We can... The, karma has, the whole thing is bigger than, than, than we can't control. Hmm. I want to say that your granddaughter gives me hope that there be that wisdom in that young person and um and your words. There there's so much truth that if we can know our belonging to something larger, there is infinite flow of energy of intelligence and love that comes through that belonging and so that is where the hope is and yes we're hugely caught in energies of separation and um, we don't know how it's going to play out but we do know there's a refuge that we can keep on waking up to so um, thank you for what you're doing any anything else you'd like to say please feel free well, one small image, which comes from the Psalms in the Bible, which is an image of refuge that I like to share, which says, the refuge is sheltering under the wings of the goddess. Mm -hmm. And that's a, 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 a small sentence from one of the Psalms. And I kind of, it, it has a lot of resonance uh, for me. And one other thing that... Um, it's important locally and in the in the whole picture because people really don't know where to go from here as a community and one of the places is the sense of the interrelation of everything makes it more important to say I will sow the seeds that I can sow. And I think it's right for all of you in America who are listening because there's conflict in America and there's conflict in your street and there's conflict every and division everywhere to really look at the seeds that we sow and say, I can sow seeds that feel right, that will make change. And that's the best I can do. And I'm going to go home and sleep well at night. <laughs> and, and just to remember that we have the capacity because everything is so dynamic and 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 flexible and fluid karma is not made of stone it's bigger than us but it's not you know absolute we can change things and the sense that i can plant seeds and so can you this conversation is planting seeds we don't know where it's going to go we don't know the waves that, that, that will come from this, but all of us and each of us can plant seeds of change. And then we, that say, that's what we can do. And I'm going home and resting now. Mm. Mm. Thank you, my friend. Tara, thank you so much. And I'm really delighted. A, a wonderful, inspiring conversation for me. No, don't don't cut don't hang up yet um i just want to add and i want to thank all of you who are listening um we will give information on steven's really wonderful book uh when we put out this talk um but please remember just those last words each of us can sow seeds 
and then we can rest. It can be okay. Yeah. 